Welcome back. The Coast Guard budget request for fiscal 2022 includes $13.1 billion. $170 million of that request will go to program management for construction of the Polar Security Cutter. Vice Admiral Sandra Stowes, U.S. Coast Guard retired, former Deputy Commandant for Mission Support. Her new book is Breaking Ice and Breaking Glass, Leading in Uncharted Waters. Admiral, welcome. Thanks very much for coming on the program. What's the current state of the fleet in the Arctic and the Antarctic? Well, good morning, Francis, and thank you so much for having me. So the current state of the fleet, I'll just give you just a fraction of background. The United States Coast Guard took over responsibility for the polar icebreaking mission in 1965 when the nation's fleet of icebreakers was transferred to the Coast Guard from the Navy. And the, Coast, the U.S. had about six icebreakers at that time. And the missions in the Antarctic can only be conducted by heavy icebreakers, and the missions in the Arctic can be conducted by medium icebreakers. So we had the Polar Star and the Polar Sea, two heavy icebreakers, were commissioned in 1976. So that makes them 45 years old right now. And actually only the Polar Star remains in service. So that cutter is going through a service life extension program right now that's been funded. And we have the second icebreaker we have is the Healy, Coast Guard Cutter Healy. That's a medium icebreaker. That was commissioned in 1999 and it's 22 years old right now. So only the two Coast Guard icebreakers. There's also, for those who might know, the Nathaniel Palmer out there, a medium science icebreaker owned and operated by the National Science Foundation. That was put into service in 1992, making it 29 years old. So you can see that the state of the fleet is aging, aged. And the polar security cutters um, being built by Halter Marine, that's uh, one of the Coast Guard's top acquisition priorities. The program of record is for three heavy icebreakers. The first two are fully funded, and the third, as you just mentioned, Francis, is in the fiscal 2022 budget. The the fleet overall, as you as you state, is aged dramatically over the years and has not aged well. There was the anecdote recently of a uh, uh, member of the crew of the Polar Star having to go on eBay to find a part in order to be able to continue the service of the ship. It's a small piece, it just doesn't exist anymore in the traditional defense industrial base. What's this, what's, what's the, what does that say about where we are today, given that the Arctic becomes more and more important in particular every day? You know, the Arctic is more and more important. Um, the U.S. has national interests at both of the poles and um, other nations, both in the Arctic and, uh, both Arctic nations and non-Arctic nations are establishing presence in the Arctic and in the Antarctic. I know you asked about the Arctic mm -hmm. and Russia is of course building air and sea bases in the Arctic to project power. Down in the Antarctic, uh, China is building stations to establish presence. So as a, our former commandant of the Coast Guard, Admiral Thad Allen had said at the time when the Arctic was just emerging as a new operating area, he said something to the effect that in the Arctic, there's water where there used to be ice. So the Coast Guard has a responsibility to conduct uh, and operate and execute its missions in that area. So we need to show sovereign presence uh, up there in the Arctic. We need to enforce laws and treaties and do the Coast Guard missions. It's a new space to um, operate in and we have a responsibility to be there. A lot of focus over the last several months in particular because of that activity in the Arctic. I'm surprised that we're not hearing more about the Antarctic. You describe, you, we talked about it offline uh, pretty significantly. You write about it uh, extensively in your book. What is the strategic significance of the Antarctic today and what's the potential strategic significance of it moving forward, Admiral? So the Antarctic today is a long way away and you know, you have to say there's something to be said about out of sight, out of mind. And I know from being a polar icebreaker sailor, just having uh, been to both poles long, a long time ago for the uh, for the north side, but um, there's a misunderstanding even of what the Arctic is and what the Antarctic is by average people. If you ask polled people, you'd probably find a lot of people didn't know the difference between the Arctic and the Antarctic, didn't know that the Arctic is an ocean and the Antarctic is a, a massive continent um, and, and that sort of thing. So in the Antarctic, there's a treaty that was uh, signed in 1959 governing the, the space down there, the geography. There's a lot of nations that have an interest in that. It's a, it's a content that has a lot of um, resources, natural resources that of course could be 
conceivably harvested. Um, the U.S. interest down there are science. We've got South Pole Station, which has incredible science research programs going on down there, funded and sponsored by the National Science Foundation. And the Coast Guard supports that mission with ice breaking, heavy ice breaking in the Antarctic. And that's a space that uh, America needs to provide and have a presence in because it could be uh, geopolitically very significant at some point, although it is less on the radar now than the Arctic is. We have about a minute left, Admiral. What do you want people to take away from this new book? What do you want people to learn from what you have to say? I, I'm going to stick with a polar theme. So leadership in the Arctic, leadership in the Antarctic and the polar regions is no different than leadership in an organization. There's an awful lot of things to consider um, with respect, civil conversations, diversity and inclusion. There's a lot of in indigenous people living in the Arctic. There are environmental issues with climate change to consider. There are eight Arctic nations that are part of the Arctic Council. There's 13 that are non-Arctic states that want to be in on the issues up there. There's a lot of issues and no treaty in the Arctic. And I think the leadership is very important. And the U.S. has a great chance to lead in a peaceful domain and keep it that way. Uh, when you look at the world and the conflict we have, this is a great opportunity through the Arctic Council, the Coast Guard Forum, the Arctic Coast Guard Forum, and the IMO for the United States to take a leadership role. And I'm glad to see Secretary of, Secretary of State Blinken doing that with his recent visits to three Arctic nations. Admiral, thanks very much for joining me today. I appreciate your time. Congratulations on your book. Thank you, Francis.